Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amanda Silver Westrick with the Geography Department at UCLA, and um, I'm actually talking about a topic very similar to what Barbara talked about. I'm talking about um, water acquisition processes and how women are primarily responsible for them and what types of social and public health consequences that might have in communities. So uh, last summer, I went with UCLA Travel Study, and I lived in Senegal in West Africa for two months, um, taking classes in sustainable development and conducting my own personal research on gender roles and inequalities within water acquisition. And so there's Senegal. Um, so I lived in Dakar with a French and Wolof-speaking family for the most part, but I also traveled up to Gede Chantier, a rural community in northern Senegal on the Douai River, very close to the border with Mauritania. And Gede is very small. It has about 12,000 residents in the greater area. It's 100% Muslim, and most of the people are fishermen and farmers. Um, in 1991, a Chinese development project it uh, constructed a water tower and a hydraulic infrastructure with pipes going to four out of six of the neighborhood districts in Gede. So this is Fres Bay, which is one of the districts in Gede Chantier without access to piped water. And um, so these two districts in Gede that don't have access to piped water have to get water from public open wells and from the Douai River, which Gede is, is right there adjacent to. So um, throughout my research, I worked with other students who were researching water issues and we interviewed local residents together. We interviewed over 250 residents, including the mayor, the local physician, and the water management board. And we interviewed them um, individually and also in groups to try to make them feel more comfortable about um, being explicit about their concerns about water accessibility and cleanliness. So um, in Gede, 100% of the interviewees stated that water acquisition is always the responsibility of women and girls. And they actually laughed at the idea of men doing such a task because the act of carrying buckets on one's head is considered a culturally female task. And they, they mentioned that the young boys, if you ask them to do such a task, they would refuse to because they didn't see their fathers doing such a thing and they wanted to emulate their fathers. So. It is always the girls and women who go to fetch water. And um, a lot of the individuals stated that this was due to their religious values, that they interpreted the Quran to mean that women should obey their husbands and that they should bring their husbands things that they needed, including water. So, um, so this is a very common... Uh, act throughout all of Senegal and throughout all of um, rural Africa as well. So this is the other uh, district in Senegal, or in Gede, without access to my water, Jedi. And this is one of the peripheral districts. It's furthest away from the Douai River. And uh, the public wells, the open wells, they dry out every day during the peak sun hours, which starts at approximately 11 a.m. And in the summer months, many of the wells dry out completely. So once that happens, the women are forced to walk to the Douai River to get water. So they put their buckets on their heads, and they put their babies on their backs, and they leave the older children and the elderly at home, and they head to the river, either alone or in groups. They try to go in groups if they can, but sometimes they're forced to go alone if the household is in dire need of water. And uh, this walk takes four hours a day for the women in Jedi. And uh, it's also very dangerous on the way. There are dangerous men, there are dogs and snakes, and they mentioned that uh, young girls on the walk are the most susceptible to sexual predators on the way. 
So they also get health problems, as Barbara mentioned, from the walk itself. They get um, neck and shoulder problems. It's, it's very difficult work carrying those big, heavy buckets of water. So here is a well. Um, this was about 10 a.m. in the morning um, in July. And I know you can't tell, but there are about two inches of water down there at the bottom. So um, basically dried up. And so the uh, people living around that well definitely had to walk to the river every day. Uh, so these, this big time commitment has serious consequences for the women in Gede. The girls, 100% of the interviewees said that the girls drop out of school much, much earlier than the boys do. Uh, they miss school every day to go do this walk and they are eventually are expelled because the teachers think that they've fallen too far behind. Um, they're also in charge of the household chores that involve water, so the cooking and the cleaning and washing clothes, washing babies, um, and all of that is around the water and, and takes up a huge percentage of the day. So this is the Jue River. As you can tell, it's uh, pretty brown and gross looking. Um, it has a lot of parasites in it, a lot of bacteria and parasites. And when the women reach the river, they usually sit in the water and wash their clothes, wash their babies, and cool down from the two hour walk in the 120 degree heat. And in the process, they get diseases like schistosomiasis and cholera. And um, often don't go to the local physician about it. Even though all of the interviewees stated that women get sick from the water much more often than the men do, the local physician actually sees more men than women. And there are several possible explanations for that, but um, it's likely that, that the women might confuse the symptoms with uh, menstruation or um, because for schistosomiasis, it appears as blood-tinged urine, and uh, so they don't get the treatment that they need for these, these illnesses. So I must admit that I took this picture more for the fish than anything else at the time, but um, this is my homestay mother in Gede, Kajia, and this was her cooking dinner, and so this was one of the tasks that women are constantly responsible for every day, and is, is a large time commitment. So um, I'm, my research led me to the conclusion that these inequalities in gender roles within this realm lead to very serious social and public health consequences that reverberate throughout their lives for these women. And, um, and so the question is, what can be done about this? And there is a happy ending to this story, for these communities at least. One of the members of my research group, Ashley Milton, went back in December with a development group and uh, constructed pipes. They extended the infrastructure from the current water tower and the current piping system to the two unpiped districts. So these are the trenches that they built. All of the construction was done by local residents of Gede. The jurisdiction falls under uh, the local water management board and the ownership is entirely within Gede. They uh, chose where the, the faucets should be. They chose where the pipes should be. It's very community-based development project. And the families, all after this development project, said that their daughters are going to be able to stay in school much, much longer. So like Barbara's work, this type of development, it affects women in a very direct way that is very important to consider when we think about what types of development we should be approaching. And also, the water is much cleaner than river or open well water. And so public health in the area is improving quite a lot since the construction of the pipes. So it, this is um, the mayor of Gede Chantier and one of my professors from the summer, Uzman Pham. And uh, it's hard to tell in the 
bottom right corner, but that's the faucet. And they were all waiting to see if water would come out of the faucet. And it did. I wish I had a picture of the happiness after that. But um, So another, another important lesson to learn from all of this is also that women deserve a voice on water management boards internationally. Women control the acquisition, the distribution, and the use of water in households all over Sub-Saharan Africa, and yet they're drastically underrepresented on management boards and decision-making bodies. In Gede, for example, the Water Management Board, out of 33 members, only eight of them are women. And I was actually impressed by that number. I thought that was pretty high. So women need to be given more of a voice in these decisions because this is under the realm of their jurisdiction. And um, as, I can't remember who mentioned this, but as someone mentioned also, um, women are very well equipped to handle microcredit loans. In Senegal, for example, the, the women are more than twice as likely to pay back their loans on time as the men are. So microcredit institutions are becoming more and more willing to give money to women over men in similar situations. So the, the road ahead is not bleak, and these types of development projects do make really tangible differences. And it was very clear to me throughout this research that this is the way to go. Thank you. She was actually kind enough to wrap up and finish and give us a few minutes, which we appreciate. Our last presenter uh, for the session is Rael Kedar. Did I say it right? Yes. yes. And on African Court of Women.